We're joined on the panel here um, by Dr. Kenneth Katzman, my colleague, uh, a specialist in the Middle East section at the Congressional Research Service. Uh, as you all know, Ken uh, is an expert on uh, the Gulf states, uh, Iraq, Iran, uh, and is uh, leading our effort uh, on the response to the Islamic State crisis. Uh, we're also joined today by Dr. Imad Harb, who is a Distinguished International Affairs Fellow here at the National Council, uh, also a former senior researcher at the Emirates Center for Strategic Studies. Uh, to his left, uh, we're joined by uh, um, General uh, Mark Kimmett, who served over 30 years uh, as a U.S. military officer in a wide variety of command, operational, and policy positions. Uh, former Assistant Secretary of State for Political Military Affairs uh, at the U.S. Department of State, and also the former Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense um, <clears throat> for Middle East Policy. Uh, if I could uh, please have your attention, please, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, and to my uh, immediate left here, uh, Professor David DeRoche. Uh, who's a senior military fellow at the NISA Center uh, for uh, Security Studies. Uh, prior to this, he was uh, responsible for uh, defense policy uh, in the Arab Gulf states uh, in Yemen, uh, and also served in the Office of the Secretary of Defense in a variety of positions. Uh, as I said, I I've asked our commentators to uh, somewhat foreshorten their remarks so that we can uh, get the conference somewhat back on schedule. Uh, we'll begin uh, with my colleague uh, from the Congressional Research Service, Dr. Kenneth Katzman. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Christopher. Is this, is this active? It would be good if you could come up here. Don't go there. Okay. Thank you, Christopher, and thank you again to John Duke Anthony and the Council for inviting me again to speak before this esteemed audience. I'm going to be fairly brief. Uh, this is the 32nd year in a row that people have forecast the imminent demise of the Gulf Cooperation Council. The chorus grew somewhat louder over the past year over in the schism between Qatar and some of the other states. But just like betting on the fall of the House of Saud, betting on a collapse of the GCC has proven to be a very bad bet indeed. Uh, as with most issues, the GCC states see Iran and Iraq, which I want to talk about with you today, the two large states in the Gulf, uh, in similar terms, but they're divided on what to do about them. The GCC states all see Iraq as no longer a strategic threat, it's fighting for its own life right now. And uh, the GCC states perceive Iraq as having fallen, fallen out of the U.S. orbit and into the arms of uh, Shiite uh, Iran, the Islamic Republic of Iran. The GCC sees Iran as insidious, trying to basically uh, exert its influence all over the Middle East, including Sudan, Yemen, to some extent Egypt, Gaza, Bahrain, Lebanon, Syria, as well as Iraq. <clears throat> but the title of my talk really is, is the GCC relations with Iraq and Iran, hardliners, softliners, and floaters. Uh, <clears throat> and I'll describe who's, who's in each camp. The hardliners are the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, and the United Arab Emirates. One softliner is the Sultanate of Oman. The floaters, I have as floaters, Kuwait and Qatar. The term floater comes from reality television. It refers to a contestant who doesn't enter into any one alliance or not, but just decides where they want to go later on. Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, and UAE are generally aligned. They take a hard line in Iran. They see Iran as a key threat to regional stability. They perceive a nuclear deal with Iran as uh, basically giving Iran more resources and opportunity to meddle in the Gulf. They, the three have expressed significant support for military options against Iran's nuclear program should Iran try to uh, make a nuclear breakout. They've accused Iran of openly fomenting unrest in Bahrain, which is you know, obviously one of the GCC states. Saudi Arabia and UAE sent ground forces to help the Bahraini government suppress the Shiite uprising in 2011. Some of those police units, UAE units, are still there. In fact, one UAE police officer was killed earlier this year in an IED explosion. 
all three are highly critical of former Prime Minister Nouri al-Maliki of Iraq and blamed him for Iraq's uh, collapse, uh, the collapse of the security forces <clears throat> earlier this year. Oman is my soft liner. It's on an alternative poll. Oman sees Iran as a threat to the GCC, but Iran, uh, Oman believes engagement and dialogue is the best way to deal with Tehran's ambitions. Sultan Qaboos's position is that Oman has had good relations with Iran throughout its history, and the fact that Iran's regime is now an Islamic Republic does not change the fact that Oman has had good relations, and, and Oman doesn't distinguish between, between the regimes. So Sultan Qaboos, in fact, visited Tehran just weeks after the disputed 2009 election uh, of uh, re-election of President Mahmoud Ahmadinejad at a time when Iran was being vehemently criticized for suppressing uh, the peaceful protests there. Oman also brokered the U.S.-Iran talks that led to this interim nuclear agreement that we're still under. <clears throat> Oman has not supported any of the opposition groups in Syria, perhaps because Oman does not want to antagonize uh, Iran. Uh, because, you know, obviously Iran is supporting uh, President Assad of Syria. <clears throat> I have Kuwait and Qatar in my floater category. That's not in any way to criticize their policies, but instead to analyze. Uh, it, is in to, it is to assert that in many ways the policies of Kuwait and Qatar toward these two big powers, uh, big, uh, big countries, is somewhat inconsistent. Even within this, I would distinguish between Qatar, which I would call an aggressive floater, meaning that it acts often in seemingly disparate ways, but as a product of deliberate policy to affect outcomes uh, and, and, and to try to show that it is not basically a puppet of Saudi Arabia. Kuwait I would have as a passive floater, which means it often to, defers to the Saudi-Bahrain-UAE axis and rarely takes bold action on its own. This is in part because of Kuwait's vibrant domestic politics. There's a vocal and visible opposition that must be taken into account before the government takes action. <clears throat> in practice, this often creates uh, a level of paralysis in Kuwait's uh, external actions. Qatar is an active floater in that it tries to engage all parties in the region, build as many relationships as possible, even if these relationships uh, you know, sometimes conflict with each other. Qatar has consistently engaged Iran while at the same time hosting the largest and perhaps most significant installations that are used by the U.S. military in the Gulf. Unlike Oman, Qatar has been actively supporting acti uh, anti-Assad groups in Syria, even though that has upset Iran. On the, and Qatar has supported Hamas. On the other hand, Qatar has supported Hamas to some extent, whose main benefactor has been Iran, and which still gets some Iranian uh, support. Qatar did not intervene to support the Bahrain government in 2011, although that likely had more to do with the Bahrain-Qatar uh, dispute that was uh, resolved by the uh, International Court of Justice. Kuwait's membership in my floater category is primarily a product of its position on Iraq whereas the other Gulf states essentially declared former Prime Minister Maliki as persona non grata. Amir Saba of Kuwait visited Iraq while Maliki was Prime Minister, and Kuwait hosted visits by Prime Minister Maliki. Kuwait, during Maliki's term, Kuwait in fact resolved m most of the residual issues from Saddam's 1990 invasion uh, of Kuwait. And, and Kuwait, com uh, Ku Kuwait completely sidestepped the Gulf-wide view that Maliki was a sectarian instrument of Tehran. Kuwait concluded it simply could do business with Maliki, and it did business with Maliki. Kuwait's ambivalence again at, at the height of the 2011 uprising in Bahrain. Kuwait intervened in support of the Bahrain government, but only with naval forces, not ground forces, which did not seem really materially that relevant in that situation. Kuwait was trying to show that it was aligned with the Gulf states and cooperating to help the Bahrain government, but not really doing anything to materially help the Bahrain government uh, or, or intervene really that directly in that situation. It was primarily symbolic. Kuwaiti authorities have been not shy about arresting alleged Iranian spying cells in, in Kuwait. Yet, Amir Sabah also visited Tehran earlier this year and met with all the senior leaders there. 
and Kuwait has not directly supported any of the Syrian rebel groups. It has given humanitarian aid through the UN uh, to help civilians and displaced persons in Syria. So to sum up, the strength of the GCC is that its six members are able to sometimes pursue disparate policies while in no way jeopardizing their membership in the cohesive unit which is the GCC. The disputes in my view within the GC are little more than family squabbles that do not in any way in undermine the integrity of the GCC. With the GCC forming the stable cohesive grouping of six relatively domestically stable partners, possible exception of Bahrain, it is not difficult to see why the GCC is now the center of gravity in an increasingly violent, fragmented, and unstable uh, Arab world. Thank you. Thank you, Ken, for those insightful remarks. Um, Dr. Katzman's provided us a framework for, for looking at the GCC, which, as Ken said, is you know, really a, an anchor for U.S. partnership, uh, particularly as it relates now to ongoing military operations. Uh, in Iraq uh, and Syria. Uh, perhaps we can explore that a bit more in the Q&A, uh, which is my hook to encourage you all to look in the center of your tables and you'll find uh, note cards. Um, this panel would gratefully benefit from the questions that you uh, may wish to write on those and send forward. Uh, you know how this process works here at the, at the National Council Conference. Uh, so please uh, take a look at those, um, uh, write some questions for us, uh, and we'll have a lively discussion. Uh, next up, uh, we'll hear from uh, Dr. Imad Harb. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, thanks for being here. Um, I, um, it's really a pleasure to participate in this uh, on this, uh, with this group of panelists on this very, very important topic. Um, uh, I'm going to be speaking about uh, the repercussions or possibilities that may come from uh, one of America's best allies in the uh, Middle East and the Arab world, Egypt. Egypt has in uh, February and uh, August of this year uh, signed some uh, arms agreements with Russia and uh, to actually quite sizable ar uh, arms agreements. And um, uh, so I'm just looking to see uh, what might these arms agreements mean, uh, what might uh, the Egyptians want from the United States by signing this, because as far as I'm concerned, uh, these were not necessarily uh, arms deals to really change the strategic balance of the Middle East. Uh, they uh, were, uh, Egypt paid a lot of money for uh, uh, acquiring some um, uh, Russian arms, but these Russian arms can also be acquired from the United States. So uh, the idea is um, why is Egypt doing this uh, and uh, what might the American response be or what, uh, where might these uh, arms deals or uh, future dealings between the United States and Egypt be like uh, in the future, uh, foreseeable and uh, longer term. Um, uh, first of all, the arms deals uh, in February and in August basically um, uh, constituted the acquisition by Egypt of uh, some uh, uh, Mi-35 uh, helicopters uh, from Russia, uh, some uh, anti-ship uh, weapons, uh, some uh, ammunition basically, and possibly some people spoke of, uh, of Egypt being able to uh, get the uh, MiG-35 from Russia, which, uh, which would be really a, uh, a very, very interesting development if it were to pass, uh, if it were to come to pass. Um, you know, the MiG-35 is really a very prized weapon and uh, probably supersedes uh, F-16s that uh, many in the region have and Egypt itself has. So uh, we really don't know if that's going to pass or not. But um, uh, the concern here is what why did Egypt, by the way, uh, in February, uh, when uh, uh, now President Sisi visited Russia, um, he was uh, met by, the, uh, by, the, uh, by Vladimir Putin, the Russian president, who uh, basically wished him luck on his presidential uh, uh, ambitions. And uh, by that time, uh, Sisi had not actually announced that he was going to run for president. So uh, maybe uh, President Putin had something to, uh, uh, to tell us then. Um, but at any rate, um, 
from the Egyptian point of view, as far as what, 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 did, the, what, what did Egypt try to do by trying to strike this uh, rather independent uh, course of action from United States, from traditional uh, United States-Egyptian uh, uh, relations? And uh, first of all, obviously, uh, Egypt wanted to just show the United States that we can do an independent thing or two and we really don't care what you say. Um, and in that sense, they're actually not different uh, from any other uh, state that, uh, from any other uh, government that comes after a military takeover of power. Uh, it's, uh, you know, all of them try, uh, try to strike some sort of an independent, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, deal where they want to show everybody uh, that they are really independent and they can do whatever they want to do. And in the Egyptian-American uh, case, was rather very, very interesting because the Egyptian armed forces, specifically the Egyptian armed forces, have been the product of, of, of United States relationship for, uh, since 1979. Uh, and uh, so uh, you know, the United States, I think, has contributed to the tune of almost uh, over $70 billion since in foreign assistance to Egypt, both economic and military and uh, other uh, aspects. Uh, the second one is uh, basically that the, um, uh, the Egyptian government simply wanted to look at uh, basically an international, not necessarily a sponsor, but, uh, but an international power that would uh, basically provide some sort of an international legitimation or um, an international support for uh, domestic domestic politics for uh, issues that the, you know, that, uh, the Egyptian government was, was dealing with, uh, uh, is still dealing with at the time, which is basically trying to put its house in order and specifically um, uh, get rid of the Islamist opposition, uh, whether uh, moderate or um, uh, violent. Um, the third uh, uh, Egyptian uh, uh, message was basically uh, it's also a, uh, Egypt acted as a conduit for a GCC message uh, that uh, was uh, told publicly and secretly uh, uh, to the United States about uh, United States basically policy towards its allies in the Middle East and specifically the issue of whether the United States was going to actually truly rebalance to the Asia Pacific theater uh, and uh, whether it can or it can't. So uh, there was a whole lot of um, discussion of this uh, since the announcement of the new uh, uh, defense threat strategy in the beginning of 2012. Uh, and uh, the GCC countries were rather very, very upset about this uh, turn of events because uh, in the, in the uh, strategic uh, environment of the Middle East, basically it's very, very difficult to see things in gray colors. Uh, it's either black or white, and uh, GCC countries had a lot to wor worry about and uh, think that maybe a rebalance to Asia was actually a, uh, basically an abandonment of the Middle East and specifically the Arabian Gulf. Uh, so basically the Egyptian message was also a GCC message. Uh, the other one was, uh, a fourth one was that Egypt wanted the United States to really make sure that, hey, we are your strategic partner in the Middle East. Don't try to find other strategic partners specifically. And this is specifically came out after the November uh, deal with, uh, between uh, the uh, uh, P5 plus 1 and uh, the, uh, the Islamic Republic of Iran uh, with a nuclear deal. And uh, Egypt had uh, been worried about uh, what might happen uh, to uh, the relationship between Egypt and uh, the United States, and actually the Gulf and the United States as well. So this was also uh, yet another message about uh, the importance of Egypt in the American strategic picture, and also a GCC uh, concern about what, where does Egypt fit into the American strategic picture now? Uh, a fifth possible one was maybe just simply uh, some sort of a, you know, uh, um, uh, tough love, so to speak, to the United States because the United States did not come out, come out very, very fully in support of Egypt when uh, uh, Ethiopia decided to build the Renaissance uh, uh, a dam on the Nile, uh, on the Blue Nile. 
So the United States basically cautioned, uh, you know, everybody should talk to everybody else. Uh, you guys work it out a little bit, uh, don't, but they did not necessarily just jump into the fray and say, well, we're going to prevent uh, Ethiopia from doing this. And uh, so the Egyptians said, well, if you are our friend and you don't really support us in this, and this is really a life or death situation for us, maybe we can do something about it. Um, as for what the possible potential way forward would be is uh, 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 I think that Egypt is on the way to be striking uh, even though it doesn't necessarily, it can't necessarily fully afford to do so, but it will continue to strike an independent uh, course of action with, uh, with the, from the United States. And that's specifically on the issue of uh, domestic politics. Uh, I don't think that the Egyptian government is, going, is in any mood anymore to really allow a whole lot of interference in this domestic politics. Uh, I think it's up to the Egyptian government. The United States has always said, well, you know, this is a sovereign issue, obviously, but uh, I don't think the Egyptians were very happy with the United States not necessarily fully supporting the Islamist uh, government of uh, Mohammed Morsi, but uh, generally uh, also was not necessarily very happy with the, uh, with the army move uh, in July of last year. Um, uh, second, a, um, uh, the United States, I see the United States as because things are the way they are in the, in the uh, Middle East, the United States is going to start to again re-emphasize its strategic relationship with, with Egypt. I don't think it can really give that up, specifically because uh, at least uh, of relations between Egypt and, uh, and Israel and is Egypt's uh, respect for uh, and uh, adherence to the 1979 peace treaty with Israel. So uh, I think this is rather a very important issue. The other issue is that the United States really does think that uh, Egypt is a strategic uh, partner and is, uh, a, is very, very important for the, uh, for the strategic environment of the Middle East. Uh, the, um, uh, you know, uh, President Obama and President Sisi met in New York last month and, uh, you know, uh, administration officials uh, all the way from the President to State Department officials consider Egypt to be really a pivotal uh, actor in the, in the Middle East. Um, a third one is uh, um, possibly a potential um, uh, way to go forward is basically maybe that Egypt now does not necessarily have uh, an active role, so to speak. You know, it's not flying airplanes or sending soldiers to fight uh, uh, ISIS. Um, uh, it would be interesting to look, uh, to look into whether Egypt um, changes that stand once ISIS becomes truly a threat to northern Saudi Arabia on the uh, Iraqi Saudi border, and um, uh, that would be general, that would be really a very very interesting uh, kind of development. What would the Egyptians do if truly uh, Daesh de decided? Uh, Daesh, as far as uh, you know, geography is concerned, Daesh is an Anbar province in southern, southwestern Iraq, and that's specifically on the borders with Saudi Arabia. So uh, uh, it's, it's interesting to speculate whether uh, the Egyptians uh, are willing to actually go and defend Saudi Arabia if they were called upon uh, to do so. Maybe the Saudis won't do it, but uh, it's an interesting uh, thing to speculate about. Uh, uh, another one is that um, uh, uh, Egypt will always be important for the United States for Northern Africa, specifically because Libya is tanking the way it is. Uh, unfortunately, things in Libya, in Tripoli and Benghazi are not, are not that good. And uh, if uh, Libya continues to deteriorate, if the situation, the security situation in Libya continues to deteriorate, it's going to be uh, really very difficult for the Egyptians to stay out of it, simply because uh, it, it will become a direct threat to Egyptian uh, uh, stability or uh, actually um, uh, security. Um, uh, another one is uh, possibly what, what will Egypt do if truly the Houthis of, uh, of Yemen uh, who have uh, actually now, uh, you know, a lot of people uh, say that they, they are in control of the Sana'a government, if uh, the Houthis truly decide to do something on, uh, on uh, the, uh, the Bab al-Mandab on the southern uh, Red Sea. And uh, would that be something that the Egyptians would be really concerned about? I would imagine that they would be concerned about that if 
for any reason the Houthis decided to, uh, you know, uh, uh, basically play politics with the uh, freedom of the shipping lanes leading up to the canal, to the Suez Canal. So uh, these are important uh, things to, uh, to think about, and uh, I thought I'd share them with you. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, thank you, Mark. Uh, just to, to sort of sum up there, uh, I mean, I think we heard um, that perhaps this new development in Egyptian-Russian relations um, may, in retrospect, in a few years, look uh, as a bit of a sort of blip on the radar or a temporary uh, redirection that had more to do with the desire for a declaration of independence from the new Egyptian authorities. Um, uh, a desire for legitimacy uh, and recognition and a conduit for uh, regional security communication. Uh, next we'll hear from uh, Professor David DeRoche. Thank you, Chris. Uh, thanks to Dr. Anthony and Pat Mancino for having me today. It's an honor to address such a distinguished group. I'm particularly pleased to notice that we have uh, both West Point cadets and Virginia Military Institute cadets. Uh, in past years, we had Naval Academy midshipmen, but presumably their parole officers wouldn't let them attend this year. Uh, I want to thank Christopher Blanchard for his adroit chairmanship of the panel, and it's truly an honor to be seated next to General Kimmett in a public hearing where neither one of us have been compelled to appear under subpoena. Uh, <laughs> The topic of U.S. defense in the Middle East is particularly timely and controversial right now. Uh, sadly, this past week, Corporal Jordan Spears and Lance Corporal Sean Neal have been the first two American soldiers to die in operations against ISIS. America is at war. I'd like to stir up a bit of controversy in this August setting by pointing out a few facts which are both counterintuitive, not well known, then I'll drop the mic and leave. Fact number one, the American military commitment to the Gulf is strong, much stronger than is perceived both in the Gulf and the United States. There are actually more American tanks in the Gulf than there are in Europe. Last year was the first year since 1944 that there were no American tanks in Germany. Today there are two brigade combat team sets of equipment in Kuwait. The U.S. Navy has more mine countermeasure ships based in the Gulf than it has in the United States. The pivot wasn't away from the Gulf or the Middle East. It is planted firmly in the Gulf. The pivot was away from Europe. Mm -hmm. Fact number two. There was a misconception that Iraq was solved in the Sunni awakening and then was allowed to fall apart. The famed Sunni awakening did not solve Iraq and probably sowed the seeds of today's conflict. While the corrupt government of al-Maliki certainly played a critical part in the disaffection of Iraq's Sunni regime, the rise of Daesh can also be seen as a logical and predictable consequence of one of the key tenets of the famed Sunni awakening in Iraq, the formation of local Sunni militias in the Sunni heartlands. Paying Sunni tribesmen to provide muscle against al-Qaeda affiliated groups, thus sanctioning an ethnically based armed force beyond government control, was achieving a short-term success at the expense of the long-term viability of the central Iraqi state. And on that, Max Weber and I are both in agreement. Third fact, he's, he's dead and <laughs> I'm not getting any younger. Third fact. It is in the United States' political interest to prevent Daesh from winning in Syria and Iraq, but it is definitely not in the United States' political interest to swiftly defeat Daesh in Iraq, and it may not be in its interest to swiftly defeat Daesh in Syria. Prior to the rise of Daesh, there was no impetus for reform in the Iraqi government. We are bit players now in Iraq, as I was recently told by one expert returning from Baghdad, and our entreaties to the Amaliki government to become a true national government were largely, in the absence of the ISIS threat, ignored. Similarly, the unprecedented Arab participation in operations against Daesh in Syria, not unprecedented in that they did it, but unprecedented in that they wanted it to be known publicly that they did it. Arabs do many things more than they want publicized. Our partners are, are generally more muscular in private than they are in public. Um, suggests that the Gulf U.S. freeze in relations since the ill-named Arab Spring have thought out considerably. Nothing overcomes a difference of opinion more effectively than a shared enemy. Fourth inconvenient fact. American weapons sales policy in the Middle East, and indeed globally, will continue to be mostly devoid of economic motive. 
Let me say that again. American weapons sales policy in the Middle East and globally will continue to be mostly devoid of economic motive. This is hard for people to to, uh, to settle in, but it is. The American government continues to have a conflicted and dysfunctional system of arms sales. The stop and start nature of U.S. holds and suspensions of sales to Bahrain and Egypt, for example, reflects the unsuitable nature of a system which is not designed to send messages or register disapproval of actions at a state-to-state -state level. Unfortunately, the only message we have managed to send from our recent actions in suspending arms sales is that we are an unreliable partner. The United States has not gained any practical leverage from these actions, but we have compromised our reputation as a reliable security partner in exchange for next to no change in behavior. The people who administer this system, however, are not driven by commercial considerations, unlike in European countries. And uh, we have an expert here who can uh, correct or amplify my points on that. We have, for example, foregone sales of drones and missiles to our allies and see other nations, most notably the Chinese, swoop in to capture this market. Fifth and final point, and in spite of the, no the rather sour note by the inconvenient facts above, the United States remains the partner of choice and the acknowledged world leader in most high technology defense systems, particularly combat aircraft and air defense systems. Even with our dislike system of long congressional consultations, consultation in this instance being a metaphor for indeterminate delay, and our detested releasability system, detested by our partners who want to buy things from us, our partners in the Middle East know that the United States is the only country that will deploy in militarily significant numbers to protect them, and thus, if they wish to participate actively in their own defense, they have to be militarily compatible with us. I've been brief in my remarks to stimulate questions. I welcome your points and promise to answer them honestly, although I have to warn you that if the questions are too difficult, once again, I may break out in tears. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> oh, 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 yes, I'm sorry, I have to do a disclaimer. I, I should, it shouldn't need to be said after those remarks, but my remarks do not reflect the position of the Department of Defense, the National Defense University, or any agency of the U.S. government. <laughs> Hey Dave, w which, <laughs> which is usually a signal for someone about to say something interesting. So th thank you, David. <laughs> uh, Mark, I'll just I'll toss it over to you after that. I think okay. that speaks for itself. <laughs> yeah, what I'd like to do uh, is is narrow down a little bit from the strategic level, which we started out with, down to the tactical level, and I want to talk about a poorly trained, poorly resourced, poorly equipped, poorly motivated army that can't fight. And I think that's one of the fundamental problems that we have in the Middle East is we have those types of armies. But I'm actually not talking about the Middle East armies. I'm talking about the United States Army in 1980 that I first came up in. The Army of the United States in 1980 was miserable, and anybody that was part of that army knows how bad we were. It is just the grace of God that we didn't get in a war at that time because we couldn't have fought our way out of a paper bag. And I think one of the reasons I bring that up is because this whole topic of defense cooperation comes to the understanding of why the United States is uniquely positioned to train, equip, resource, mentor armies in the Middle East, navies in the Middle East, air forces in the Middle East, because for God's sakes, please learn from the mistakes that we made. You've got to ask the question, how can an army like ISIL, which is a couple of thousand well-equipped soldiers. Why are they so successful on the battlefield against the Syrian army, against the Iraqi army? What's their secret sauce that has caused them to do what we haven't seen in the world since the German army went through the French army in 1940, which at that time was the largest and best equipped army in the world? Uh, my answer would be I think we have some, in various degrees, of responsibility within the armies and the militaries and the security forces in the Middle East, symptoms that the American defense community, whether it's the defense offices and the embassies or whether it's many of the corporations that are represented here today primarily by ex-serving officers, what they try to bring to the region. So I want to bring it down to just a couple of factors that all of the countries in the region 
I've seen because I spend most of my time over there. I just got off the plane from Cairo and Baghdad on Friday, and I continue to see a series of consistent problems that, quite frankly, are far less than those same problems we had in the U.S. Army in 1980. They really come down to, like everybody else here, I've got my list of five as well. It comes down to training, it comes down to logistics, it comes down to leadership, doctrine, resources, and that's five. Let me talk about them in turn. In doctrine and training, uh, the fact remains, if you want to take the specific instance of Iraq, it has not trained since the Americans left in December 2011, so it shouldn't be a surprise to anybody that when they had to fight on the battlefield, uh, they didn't demonstrate that they were ready to do that. People say, how can we put a couple of billion dollars into the Iraqi security forces and then see such results on the battlefield? And the answer is, if you stop training a pilot, three years later he's no longer a pilot. If you don't shoot your weapon in three years, when the time comes to shoot your weapon, you're not going to be ready. When it comes to platoon exercises, if your platoon training area, your company battalion training area of Best Mai is closed down, then when your platoons and your battalions and your brigades are asked to fight, they're not going to be ready. Um, it's that simple. And so I would advocate that throughout the region, and to some extent one of the great arguments we're having in the sequestration debates in the defense uh, budget debates in the United States is, where is the money left for training? And the fact is, if you don't train, you can't fight, and if you can't fight, you're going to lose, and we've seen that recently on the battlefield. I believe that within the United States military and within the Middle East military, at least one-third of their budget ought to go to routine, regular training. At the individual level where they learn how to shoot their weapons, at the collective level where they learn how to maneuver as squads, at the battalion, brigade, and so on. Do they need to be of the same capabilities United States Army? Probably not. But to be able to be swept aside and lose almost the size of the state of New Hampshire to a pretty motivated, lightly equipped militia, which is what ISIL really turned out to be, uh, is indicative, number one, of poor training. The second area that I think needs to be looked at is the logistics. The fact is one of the hard lessons that the United States military learned is you can't just buy a truck. Soldiers also have to maintain that truck. There are a number of people that have sat here as young officers and pulled dipsticks out of trucks every Monday morning at the, in the motor pool. They have learned how to keep their equipment running. They have not depended on somebody else to do that. They realize that if the tank doesn't work, the tanks not get to get the, to the battle, and if it doesn't get to the battle, it is useless. And that's what we've seen in recent battlefields in the Middle East, most particularly inside of Iraq, that quite frankly, one of the reasons they were unable to fight is because they were unable to get the equipment that hadn't been maintained, hadn't seen repair parts, hadn't seen spare parts done for a number of years, ever since the U.S. military pulled out and took that combat ethic and that maintenance ethic with them. We could talk all day about leadership. Soldiers won't fight if they don't trust their leaders. Soldiers won't stand and put their lives on the line if their sergeants aren't going to be next to them, if their lieutenants aren't next to them, if their commanders are not worthy of their loyalty, and if the commanders are not worthy to stand up and fight alongside of them. And if you have a military where you select leaders not on the basis of merit, but on the basis of perhaps political affiliation or any other reason, uh, your soldiers are not going to stand up and fight. You can talk about all sorts of reasons about politics and how the maps were drawn in the Middle East. Soldiers fight for one reason only, and that's because they got somebody to their left and their right that they believe in, that they can trust, and that they are willing to stand and fight with. It has been seen time and time again since the days of Thermopylae up until the fights that we see going on in the region now. If the leaders aren't there, don't expect your soldiers to be there. If the leaders won't fight, don't expect your soldiers to fight. So what would I recommend? 
I would finish up by saying as the United States continues to support defense cooperation at the strategic level, please understand that the United States Security Assistance Offices and all the embassies, and whether it's in the United States military training mission in Saudi Arabia, Office of Military Cooperation in Kuwait, uh, the military assistance program we have in Jordan, you've got groups of young combat professional soldiers that are willing to help out your countries so you don't make the mistakes in your country that we saw made in the era after the Vietnam War. It remains our committed purpose that among the relationships between our countries, whether it's diplomatic, whether it's economic, whether it's ideological, on a day-to-day -day basis, the people that are there most frequently and most visibly are those soldiers inside the embassy and inside those units that are trying to help. That to me is the tactical lesson of the subject of this panel of de defense cooperation. American soldiers, sailors, airmen and marine standing next to their Middle East counterparts trying to learn from each other about having a way to make an army, a navy, an air force that is responsible to its people, accountable to its laws, and is able to defend the country from both interior and exterior threats. Um, I've been doing that for the past 30 some years. I'm proud to go to the Middle East to try to help out, whether it's in uniform, whether it's wearing a coat and tie as part of the State Department or as an independent. And I suspect that probably one third of the people inside this room know exactly what I'm talking about because they've stood in my shoes before. But if we're gonna get this defense cooperation right, We've got to enhance the capability of the militaries in the Middle East to fight not only against high-level, high-strategic threats, but also against low-level nuisances, which quite frankly, when it comes to military capability, that's all ISIL really is. So thank you very much. Thank you, General Commit. Um, I think that was a very clear-eyed prescription for uh, U.S. partners in the region um, and an agenda uh, that should, uh, I think, guide the future of uh, cooperative defense relations between the United States uh, and its partners. Uh, we're lucky to have uh, now uh, Dr. John Duke Anthony to serve as a commentator for our panel, um, and he's well known to all of you. Uh, I'd just emphasize um, you know, a few notes about his military service uh, and also his continued service to the United States military. Uh, not only is Dr. Anthony a graduate of the Virginia Military Institute, but he served uh, in artillery in the United States Army uh, and as many of you know, uh, has provided decades uh, of support uh, to soldiers, uh, sailors, airmen, and Marines uh, across the region, um, continuing to guide uh, um, study trips uh, and provide uh, educational and tutoring support uh, to uh, officers, uh, 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 including um, current chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, uh, Martin Dempsey, I understand. Um, and we're, we're lucky to have him here to uh, provide commentary on the remarks you just heard and, and set the table for our discussion in Q&A. Dr. Anthony. Uh, uh, thank you, Christopher. Uh, my remarks will be uh, more in the realm of comments that were not made but I think are relevant, timely, um, and applicable uh, to some of the policy-related challenges and also some of the, uh, the assets that we have that uh, many people think uh, we do not have in the region and uh, there would be many who would like to see us vacated, many Americans rather, uh, and have the focus uh, more on domestic economic and political issues infrastructure issues in the United States. And so my context comments would be in these contexts that the speakers didn't make, and I'll take issue with one of them. I think the area of, of uh, the Eastern Arabian Peninsula, the uh, six GCC countries from Kuwait, Bahrain, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, and Oman is unique among the 22 Arab countries the 28 Middle Eastern countries, the 57 Islamic countries, in the following uh, rather fundamental, pervasive, uh, massive way, that every second for the last 400 years, external defense of these six countries has been attended to, administered by a foreign power, a non-regional power, a Western power, a power linked with Christian uh, uh, faith more than Judaism or Islam or any of the Asian 
faith said. You cannot say this about Arab North Africa. You cannot say it about the Levant. You cannot say it about the Fertile Crescent. You cannot say it about the Nile Valley uh, Basin or Eastern Ara uh, Africa. So this makes this region unique in the sense that cooperation on the defense issues with Western powers has been the norm, not the exception. Now, mind you, there were no independence movements in the areas of Kuwait, Bahrain, Qatar, the Emirates, and Oman. No general strikes, no delegations that went to the uh, British and others that said, it's about time you fellows leave, we'd like to join the League of Arab States, United Nations. My point being that there's a degree of usness in this one particular region that does not pertain to Arab North Africa, where France uh, has a greater overhang, or in East uh, Africa, uh, and uh, where Italy, uh, and with regard to Eritrea and Ethiopia, had a footprint in Libya as well, and uh, not to mention uh, the, the British uh, throughout uh, Eastern Arabia. But we start with the Portuguese, 400 years ago, then the Dutch, then the British, then the increasingly the Americans. In the footprint, the standards, the weights, the measurements, the plugs, the uh, things that work uh, were pretty much laid down by the British, not by the Americans. And so there is a, 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 an debt there that uh, would be very difficult to pay. Uh, to several other points here. Uh, there are defense cooperation agreements with four of the GCC countries, uh, Kuwait, Bahrain, uh, Qatar, and the United Arab Emirates, but preceding them by 10 years is an older one that set the pace for the others, namely an access to facilities agreement in 1979 with the Sultanate of Oman right after the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan in early 1980, uh, President Carter. Uh, fashion that agreement, and it still holds strong. Now, you might say, well, what about Saudi Arabia? There isn't one for Saudi Arabia. There is one for the others. Here is where we don't want to have form be confused with function. Uh, Saudi Arabia doesn't have one, but substantively, I would argue it has more than all the others combined put together. In terms of longevity, from the early 1950s, and in terms of not just a U.S. military training mission, but the advisory mission to the U.S. Saudi Arabian National Guard. This is where I first met General Dempsey. He was the American who saw then Crown Prince Abdullah uh, almost daily for weeks on end where the American ambassador might be lucky if he saw the uh, Crown Prince once every six weeks. So that kind of a foundation was not mentioned by our speakers. One speaker said that uh, American weapons policy is devoid of economic motive. I couldn't disagree more. Um, the two controversial ones that uh, broke the Israeli lobby's lock on uh, advanced technological uh, weapon sales to Arab countries were in the late 70s with the F-15s and the early 80s with the AWACS. Now, had those victories not been uh, won, and they were won largely by the, uh, the public global corporate community uh, that went in, the Lockheeds, the Northrop's, the Northrop Grumman's, the Raytheon's, the Allied signals going into senators' offices there, uh, saying, Senator, a yes vote equals 13,000 jobs in your state, and no vote equals zero votes in your state. Thank you, Senator, very much for your time. It was very effective. And had those victories not been won, in, in June or July of 1984, an Iranian fighter pilot was streaking uh, uh, towards uh, eastern Saudi Arabia, right over where 5,000 Americans go to work every day at Saudi, Arabia, Saudi Aramco then. Um, they were knocked out of the sky over the Gulf by a combination of those F-15s and AWACS. Couldn't have been done otherwise. The point is, Iran has never done something like that since. So it's hard to prove a negative that these cooperative agree agreements have contained or deterred Iran, um, uh, but uh, the evidence is that it has not tried to defy any of those agreements and arrangements. So that's, that's uh, good news there. On the uh, Peninsula Shield, this is probably the most 
misunderstood and underappreciated aspect of what the GCC countries have tried to do. Uh, late in 1984, it was established as a collective force in northwestern uh, Saudi Arabia. And people have said, truly, it cannot fight its way out of a paper bag. And some say, wait a minute, a, a wet paper bag it cannot fight itself out of. True. And uh, none of the GCC armies are, are naive or believed to the contrary. Its existence has a strategic aspect, not a tactical one. A strategic aspect, because all six say that an attack on one is an attack on all six. And it is much easier to get France to come and Britain to come and America to come and China and Russia to come when you say six are asking us to come to their defense, their national sovereignty, their political independence, their territorial integrity. So this is the context in which I would see the Peninsula Shield, not in terms of its tactical uh, flaws and shortcomings and limitations. With regard to Dubai, uh, Dubai, as uh, people want to have the brand name Dubai, Shanghai, Mumbai, uh, whatever, some other eyes uh, there. Uh, this is the place where more American sold, uh, sailors, men and women, set foot ashore uh, every year than any other place on the planet outside of the United States for the last 15 to 20 years. No small uh, matter there. Uh, with regard to the um, uh, no economic motive, it's there. Uh, the aerospace and defense industries are big contributors to the American Treasury taxes as such. Uh, they help to extend production lines. They help lower per unit cost. Uh, they bring about an usness in terms of modernization, development, and technology, and human resources, education, and training. Uh, all of that is wrapped in together with the economic uh, motive, and it's largely served the United States well in comparison with the uh, aerospace and defense sectors elsewhere. Mm -hmm. How do you want to? Uh, I Up think to you. You, you wrap it. You summarize it. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Uh, okay, ladies and gentlemen. Um, uh, we've been directed uh, to conclude our panel, unfortunately, uh, without uh, much Q&A. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, the powers that be, <laughs> such as they are, have, uh, <laughs> have pulled the plug on us in order to, to reset the schedule. Um, That's right. we, uh, I would encourage you, uh, however, uh, to <laughs> pigeonhole our, uh, our panelists here uh, in the lobby. Um, you know, I'll, I'll, I can prime some of that discussion by, uh, by suggesting, uh, you know, several of the, of the questions that were submitted focused on, you know, uh, how our partnership uh, with Iraqi forces or with Syrians ought to be guided by um, some of the lessons learned from the last 10 years in Iraq and Afghanistan, um, the future of GCC, deeper integration, all of these issues are on the table. Um, by all means, please grab them by their elbows uh, and, uh, <laughs> and talk their ears off over coffee. Um, but uh, time marches on and so do we. So. Here's, some, here's some of the questions. How did the GCC countries perceive a military strike by the U.S. or Israel against Iran? Given the views of many that such an attack would likely put multiple GCC <coughs> countries and their respective infrastructures in danger, uh, how can the U.S. better work with its Arab partners on cyber uh, security and work that into joint defense uh, training uh, there? Uh, how is it that we can uh, increase the level of budgetary support for the Arab components of the international military education and training program? Uh, this provides the usness between us and the leaders of other countries. They may be lieutenants, captains, majors, lieutenant colonels, colonels when we uh, work together and train them, but there is created thereby an usness that serves both peoples well ever thereafter. And with that, I believe we're adjourned.